Midway through the 18th century, the British citizens living in the colonies were still very much loyal subjects of the crown. However, as the just over 1 million people who were now spread over 13 colonies became more and more industrious, they were also becoming more and more frustrated with the lack of input they had over the taxation and the laws that came down from Great Britain. These were the things that governed their lives, and they didn't like it. And in fact, it seemed every time they started to gain an economic foothold in the New World, the British Parliament or the King would pull it out from under them. One example of this was the Iron Act of 1750. It was a law passed by Parliament that put a halt to the growth of the iron finishing business that was thriving in the colonies. The act was passed to protect the English iron industry, which was definitely feeling the effects of the burgeoning American colonial iron business. With the motherland over 4,400 miles away, any attempt on the part of the colonists to address their issues with Parliament or the Crown was a huge undertaking. The trip from England to America that now takes a matter of hours took two to three months at the time, depending on the winds and the weather and even longer going the other way. The round trip would be at least six months of travel alone, plus whatever time it took to address their issues in London. Nowhere was the irritation in England more keenly felt than in America's third largest city, Boston, whose population of 15,000 was, as in the rest of the colonies, loyal to Britain, but becoming increasingly disenchanted. The seeds of American patriotism were being planted, and at least one of these, infected with American fervor, came from a very unlikely place to become a patriot. He came from slavery. Forgotten over the centuries is that the British institution of slavery, while much more prevalent in the southern colonies, was in fact also practiced in 18th century Massachusetts. And in 1750, an advertisement appeared in the Boston Gazette, taken out by a white landowner. He was offering 10 pounds for the return of a young runaway slave. That would be the equivalent of about $2,000 today. The ad read, ran away from his master William Brown from Framingham on the 30th of September last. A mulatto fellow, about 27 years of age, named Crispus, six feet, two inches high, short curled hair, his knees nearer together than common, had light colored bearskin coat. William Brown included a warning in the ad. In addition to the reward Brown offered for the man's return, he ended with the following admonition. And all matters of vessels and others are hereby cautioned against concealing or carrying off said servant on penalty of law. Crispus Attucks was never caught. He would also turn up on vessels many times over the next 20 years. He became a sailor working on a whaling crew that sailed out of Boston Harbor. Attucks was the son of Prince Younger, a slave shipped to America from Africa, and Nancy Attucks, a Natick Indian. He was believed to have been born 1723 in Framingham, Massachusetts. No one knows how Attucks escaped the terrible life that William Brown imposed on him as a slave. We do only know that he did escape and lived as a free man the rest of his life. Crispus Attucks fell in love with his life as a sailor and with his life as a free man in the American colonies, even though he lived his first 27 years there in bondage. Between 1750 and 1770, British oppression of the colonies increased. Taxation without representation continued to be a major problem. The British also tried to keep the colonies from trading with other nations. The British government passed the Sugar Act, the Currency Act, the Stamp Act, and the Townsend Act, just to name a few. The British Parliament also issued writs of assistance that gave British officers the power to search any residence or building without warning or supervision and to confiscate whatever they deemed to be smuggled or otherwise improperly obtained goods. They cracked down on any protest or dissent and gave immunity to corrupt or abusive British officials. There was no right to trial by jury and the colonials were forced to house British soldiers. By 1770, many colonists, including Crispus Attucks, had enough. On March 2nd, Crispus and several other sailors and rope makers were involved in a fight with three British soldiers. On March 5th, 
Tensions escalated when a British soldier looking for work entered a Boston pub, only to be greeted by a group of incensed sailors, one of whom was Attucks. The situation intensified until eventually the British opened fire. Crispus Attucks was the first of five men killed. His murder made him a black man, the first casualty of the American Revolution. As not only the first black man to fall, but the first American to fall on what became known as the Boston Massacre, Attucks became a martyr. His body was transported to a public space where others killed in the attack lay in state. City leaders even waived the laws around black burials and allowed the first black founder, Crispus Attucks, to be buried with the others at the Park Street Cemetery. Attucks became a hero of the residents of Boston. John Adams, who defended the British soldiers in the massacre trial, was not as enamored. Adams reviled the mad behavior of Attucks, whose very looks was enough to terrify any person. He had hardness enough to fall in upon them, and with one hand took hold of the bayonet and with the other knocked the man down. This was the behavior of Attucks, whose mad behavior in all probability, the dreadful carnage of that night, is chiefly to be ascribed. And it is in this manner, this town has often been treated, a car from Ireland and an Attucks from Framingham happening to be there shall sally out upon their thoughtless enterprises at the head of such a rabble of negroes and company as they can collect together and then they're not wanting persons to ascribe all their doings to the good people of the town end quote john adams that was john adams duty to deflect the blame from the british soldiers he defended to the patriots who had enough of british oppression Adams won a not guilty verdict at the trial. History, however, sees Crispus Attucks differently. 88 years later in 1858, Crispus Attucks Day was inaugurated by black abolitionists. In 1888, the Crispus Attucks Monument was erected on the Boston Common, despite the opposition of the Massachusetts Historical Society and the New England Historic Genealogical Society, which regarded Attucks as a villain. Some members of the Massachusetts Historical Society were strongly opposed to its erection, remembering the events as John Adam described it in court. Despite their objections, the monument was supported by prominent citizens, including black and white abolitionists, and was erected in 1888. It was fully paid for by public funds. Then, in 1964, in his book, Why We Can't Wait, Dr. Martin Luther King lauded addicts for his moral courage and his defining role in American history. For whatever the reason, over the years, American history has forgotten our black founding fathers, our black founding patriots like Crispus Attucks, who rose from slavery to oppose oppression and fight for American independence. 